We're going to jump right into our global e-commerce growth panel, uh, revisiting opportunities in China. So, um, yeah, I want to thank all these guys, uh, all of whom have been uh, part of the conversation about China e-commerce for, for quite a while. Aaron, however, is, is our, our kind of new addition to the speaker. And Gary, I don't know if we've had you live on stage, but Gary was part of our Oktoberfest, which was our, our virtual uh, shindig that we did last fall when we couldn't come to New York to do Gulf, uh, Gulf New York. So um, what we're going to do today is just really kind of have a, an open conversation, a lively panel. Um, I'm going to let the guys introduce themselves. And the other nice thing, too, is that when I was talking to Kai, obviously Kai uh, joined us yesterday, you know, he, he started talking about, you know, some stuff that they were doing in China, which was a little different than they had done in the past. So uh, that was kind of part of the seed for this, this panel. And then when I was talking to Aaron, you know, it was very interesting to hear kind of where they're at. So what we wanted to do was really just pull, you know, some different voices together. Uh, I think at Gelf, every time we've done an event, we've had a China session. So it's definitely one of the top session topics but there's always a different uh, dialogue. So uh, enough of me. I'm just going to let these guys introduce themselves. And I'd like to ask you guys to give the audience an idea of, of where you guys sell and what the predominant models are. And then we'll kind of move into China. So Kai, you want to say a quick hello? Hello. Uh, my name is Kai. I'm with Revolve. I've been with Revolve for six years. Prior to Revolve, I spent uh, five years at Amazon in different international roles, including ShopBob. Um, Revolve, we do everything cross-border. Uh, we ship out from a single warehouse located in South, Southern California. However, at the same time, we also have six return facilities around the world across five, uh, four continents. We have 30 uh, phone numbers in, we have a phone, uh, local customer service number in 30 uh, markets. We support 83 different currencies. We ship to over 150 countries around the world. We carry um, 800 brands. Aaron? Great. Um, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm Aaron. I'm the uh, co-founder CEO of a uh, New York-based fashion brand called Cara. Uh, we're a premium um, contemporary, depending on how you, how you look at it, uh, but we make handbags. Um, what we're known for really is high-end accessories and handbags that are functional for mainly the, uh, the millennial woman. That's the kind of the background of the brand. Um, we're about eight years old, seven to eight years old, uh, grew pretty quickly in the last uh, three, four years. Uh, we're still under $100 million in terms of sales, but you know, has seen a pretty uh, uh, amazing ride, I think, in the, uh, in the last decade. So um, we're based in New York primarily. We do ship worldwide. Uh, we have a couple of warehouses, all primarily in the US. Um, you know, we probably gonna get into China a lot more in detail. Um, we were betting on China in a big way up until 2018. 19 and 20, we kind of took a break um, for a number of reasons that we're probably going to get into. And then right now we're starting to uh, revisit China um, and kind of setting up the strategic roadmap of what that okay. country is going to look like. Uh, I think I'm in the wrong place because Kent mentioned Oktoberfest. And I, I thought <laughs> there was going to be Oktoberfest here and there was going to be a big keg of Chinese beer. and. I'm it's a under bit the thrown stage. Off. Yeah, it's yeah. under the stage. Um, I'm Gary Penn. I am the global VP of direct to consumer for Nixon. We're a men's and women's lifestyle accessories brand. Uh, we're operating in five regions, six languages, um, the latter being really important because uh, translations is a lot of work. And within that, we mostly have regional offices with regional GMs. We have three PLs in region. So we're very much an in region model as opposed to a cross border model. And we're operating across a variety of marketplaces in Europe, Japan, China, US, Canada, et cetera, as well as .com. So it's, um, it's a lot of things to keep in mind. So what I want to ask you guys now is um, to kind of talk a little bit about where China ranks in your outside of the US priorities, or Aaron, it's obviously the domestic uh, situation is interesting for you. But, you know, Gary, you brought up Oktoberfest, and, and I know we had uh, Greg from Fender on, who had actually been at our LA event, so our last live event, and they had just made a big push, a big bet on, on international in general. Everything had to go on hold during the pandemic. You know, basically, the, you know, curbside pickup, buy online pickup in store, that was, you know, priority number one. So there has been this, uh, you know, and this not just China, but about international general, there's been some pauses. So, but Kai, tell us a little bit about your recent decision. I know a couple, three years ago, eh, I don't think we'll ever deal with Tmall, and things have changed. 
Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think, um, what, you know, we, we, when we met the first time, I don't know how, how long that was ago, it was maybe five, six years ago, you talked about Tmall. I was like, why should I get on Tmall? We're a multi-brand retailer. We always uh, operate our own, our own website, and I, I see other major retailers from the U.S. going to, on Tmall and failed. So I never bothered to look into Tmall, and, and in the last couple of years, I keep knocking on our door. Um, but yeah, we started listing on Tmall uh, at the end of last year. Uh, I think the reason really triggered me to, uh, to decide to list on Tmall uh, was one day I came to, uh, you know, first of all, we, we look at a marketplace, it's a transactional site. So it, it's basically a place to consume the demand you generate, the brand awareness that you've been gen you generate. It does not create additional demand. So when I look at Marketplace uh, as a transactional site, it provides better customer experience than, than mine. Uh, it, oh, the the Revolve.com is definitely accessible to the, to the Chinese consumers. We made it accessible. The, we, we worked really hard on loading speed and then pixel and all that. Uh, have local CDN, so we did put a lot of work into it. But at the same time, we still require to have an email to log in. The whole flow is still American, so it's, it's accessible, it's not native. So when I think about marketplace, that native experience, that really helps my customer. That's really for something that I believe I should be doing. But at the same time, as a retailer, we heavily rely on retention rate. So we, we uh, over, over customer acquisition cost is high. Uh, and the reason we pay for that much is because we look at a customer lifetime value instead of value of that first, that, that single order. That, um, when I look at Tmall, you know, the, the repeat rate on annual base, you're looking at 1.2, 1.3, um, versus on uh, Revolve, you're seeing a much higher number. So that's really made me, you know, over the past years, and made me thinking, hey, this is not the model we're in. That's why I was resisting Tmall. But I, I think that at, uh, at the beginning of last year, I started to realize that Tmall does offer uh, some other values to us that I didn't never thought about. Is that we, I mentioned that we carry 800 brands. So what we did is we, made, we did a study. We look up, we, we kind of uh, went on Tmall. We try to see what brands that we, all, we have, they don't, they're, don't currently don't have a flagship store. Uh, there's still volume that have been sold through, through the C2T site, right? the, the Tmall, so the, the Taobao site, but there's no flagship store on Tmall. One thing that we should realize is that as soon as there's a flagship store for a brand popped up that it's, you know, we're talking about a B2C uh, offering, then the customer would actually move to a Tmall instead, instead of buying from a consumer because of the reputation, whatever reason there, that people, customer are more uh, willing to pay, or to, to spend, or to shop from a, 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 a Tmall store versus a, a Taobao store. So I was able to look at, we found about 200 brands that we carry there, there's no Tmall flagship store. At the same time, I, I'm able to tell the volume of those 200 brands generated from the C store. So in, in a sense, I have a crystal ball before I even list on Tmall. We know how much sales that's going to generate. That, um, you know, so that's the reason, that's pretty much the fundamental reason that I, I understand there's a free traffic on Tmall, that we have an inherited benefit because we are a multi-brand retailer. When we list on, those, uh, on Tmall, we'll be able to grab all those free traffic to us. That's the fundamental reason uh, for me to decide to list on Tmall at the beginning of last year. And of course, every time you launch a big project, I get really nervous to beat the day before, even when you did all that analysis. You know, I remember I was chewing my, my fingers the, the night before we launched. I was like, is this going to really go for it or not? Um, you know, it was, what's interesting, in the first week, we saw 80% of our traffic come from free search. Wow. And uh, they are not, people are not searching for Revolve, but they are searching exactly those emerging brands uh, that we're, we're, we have. Um, so yeah, we, uh, that's, you know, we have been doing, uh, we're happy with our Tmall result. Now we've been on it uh, for almost a year now. So it's interesting because so often one of the constraints of Tmall, or maybe that's not the right way to put it, um, is that you have to rely on them for the data. So you have a lot of your own data, and I think that gives you kind of a leg up on a lot of people. In, in my opinion, Tmall provides a lot of data, free data to you. Uh, there, there's tons of uh, uh, resources you can, you, can, you can use to get data from, uh, from Timo. They provide more, better data than any other marketplace I know. Yeah. Uh, if you look at Amazon, you know, one, one of the simplest things, right? You look at Timo, that it actually shows you that a product, the, 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 the lifetime unit's been sold or the unit's sold in the last 30 days. So when we're, you know, if you go to revolve.com, you will know that the, the product we have are, are all, all dresses. They're, they're more 
designed or selected for, curated for the Western market. So I needed to have merchandise to buy for the China uh, market. And then, you know, what style to choose? You know, if we're going to select a brand or handbag, you know, what to choose? You know, I go on Timo and I find it and then I find a proxy that I believe that's similar to what we have and tells you exactly how many units to be sold, how fast it is. I think that it's a, it's a great place for data play, uh, Timo. Mm -hmm. It's much better than any other uh, marketplace I, I know. So Gary joined us, as I mentioned, uh, on our October fat. We had Jeff Lord from Burton, uh, who has great uh, kind of China story, and, and Deborah from Corsite was uh, sharing a lot of their data. So uh, I've seen Deborah around, so if you see her, she's got great China data. But Gary, I know when I reached out, you were kind of like, oh, I don't know if, uh, you know if I'm perfect for a China panel right now. Tell us a little bit about, you know, because you were kind of, things were going, and then along came the pandemic. Where are things now, and where are you guys looking at? China in the next you know, year or so. Yeah, absolutely. We've had some successes and we've had some challenges. I, the first, we're about a year and a half, uh, two years in, depending on what you consider the ramp up time of finding a TP and establishing yourself. Um, but we kind of have the opposite challenge uh, that, that Kai was just talking about. We, as, a, as a brand, not as a multi-brand retailer, there's a certain amount of brand demand that exists in the universe and Nixon is not huge. Um, and, you know, within the watch market, we're up against the likes of Casio and, uh, and Seiko and much better known brands. And so what, what we found is year one, there was a pretty good ramp and we did hit the numbers that we were looking for. And year two has been a little flatter. Now, we've, we've offset that with an expansion into JD.com because it actually is drawing a slightly different customer, tends to skew more heavily male. Our brand tends to be more heavily male and it has slightly more technical products so that works in our favor. Uh, so that's been a success. The challenges have been more around, okay, on Tmall itself, if you tap out in your natural organic brand demand, well, where do you go? Where's your next best dollar spent? And in China, it's very, very different is what, what we're finding is it's very, very different than the US or pretty much anywhere else in the world. Uh, the, the channels are much more limited. You basically have some standard on Tmall performance marketing channels, uh, which are only as good as your either boots on the ground in China or your TP, which tend to be limited. And then you're kind of on to, okay, well, what about affiliate marketing? Well, not really. A, that's really KOL based or in, in US parlance that's uh, influencer based. Okay, well, what about uh, any other you know, organic, well, you can't really get organic, you're trapped in the marketplace. So there's a certain amount that you can hit, and then you're basically looking at the next best thing being, well, how do I actually build the brand itself? Well, you could go super high top of funnel, it's a very, very expensive thing to do. And so what we're looking at is, okay, some combination of mid to low level, level KOLs or micro influencer strategy combined with social presence. And that's where we see ourselves going for the next 18 to 24 months is okay now great we, we scraped up the easy stuff now we got to get the the higher fruit on the tree got it. and so you know you've pointed out that you guys are the authentic southern california brand and things like that and and even though you're kind of not a huge global name there's a lot of traction there aaron you guys are pretty much a, a, a brand new well not brand new you've been around for a while but you've got to build the, the brand in yeah. china so it was great because when aaron first reached out um we were talking and you know, I knew he was going to get on stage as soon as he's like, oh, you guys are about international e-commerce. So international e-commerce is China. But that's not necessarily the case now. Tell us a little bit about your journey in China. And, and your family, I know, has been there. And, you know, you guys have done a lot of research and distribution and all of that over the years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so our background, family background at least, it's manufacturing and supply chain. So work with a number of Italian luxury brands over the last three decades. So we're pretty versed with the accessories and handbag space. But taking a step back, right, when we started the brand in 2013, 2014, it was pretty much the high of the athleisure trend. Um, for those of you who know what athleisure is. So it's basically this healthy living, you know, in terms of dress, it's, you know, wearing yoga pants or stuff that you wear usually to work out, but you can wear outside of um, the workout activities. And um, so when we launched the brand, you know, most of our product are really well known for uh, versatility, right? So things that you can bring to Equinox, but then you can bring to a ballroom, to a date, to a dinner, and so on and so forth. So 
When we first launched the brand, that caught attention to a lot of celebrities in the US um, and a lot of influencers. So we did partnership with Nastia Lukin, for example, who's an Olympian in the US. We did partnership with Athleta, which is part of a gap. Um, and that called actually a lot of attention to Chinese KOL, who initially back in 2014, they actually were the initial one who reached out to us and wanted to work with us. So from 2015 to 2018, our main strategy for going to China is KOL, key opinion leaders, influencers, whatever you want to call it. And most of them had actually their own stores within like a Tmall or Taobao or Alibaba, or whatever, wherever they were. Um, so that's how we initially entered into China. The volume was actually pretty healthy uh, for smaller emerging brands back then. And then 2018 is when we started to actually thinking about working with a TP and start setting our own shop. And then we realized that basically it's very expensive you know, to do business in China as far as setting infrastructure and it's highly promotional. Um, when we did our a little bit of kind of P&L analysis between the US market with the China market, it just didn't make sense. Um, so back in 2019, we took a pause um, and um, really kind of honing on the US market and a few other markets globally. Middle East is one of them, Latam is another one that we kind of looked at. Canada is a huge market for us as well. So there were a few other global markets that we were interested in besides China. Um, when COVID hit, um, same thing, you know, the US market for us grew tremendously, so it didn't make sense to look at China. But now that the US market, at least for us, is starting to level up a little bit, um, we are starting to think about China in a bigger way as we think about 2022. Similar to Gary, I think content creation is key for us. So we're looking at KOLs. You know, the KOL, if you're familiar with the China KOL market, it's its its, its own ecosystem, right? So you have KOLs, there's different degrees of KOLs. So there's micro-influencers, macro-influencers, there's idols, uh, you know, Ito in Chinese, but it's, it's, it's basically kind of that level up and then there's the celebrity. So, we're working with an agency to actually help us source um, and work with different influencers. I think the key for us this time around is, you know, authenticity is very important for us. So instead of just kind of transactionally looking for the right fit, um, you know, and a lot of it just comes down to dollars and cents, we're actually looking for influencers to actually partner to create products together. So that's a way for us to, A, obviously give them a little bit more incentive you know, from a financial standpoint, but also just get their fingerprints and DNA into the product, right? Plus, we always believe that when you are betting on the market in a bigger way, you have to create product for that market versus trying to slam you know, product right. from the US for, for a China market. So I think you know, that makes sense anyways to work with a local influencer to create product. So I think content creation and then social commerce, it's probably where we we're going to be betting. Yeah, and, and let's stay there. I mean, obviously, we've got a lot of marketers, uh, you know, in this room as well as with the commerce next. Uh, we talked a good bit about social marketing, KOLs. I mean, this whole idea of, you know, usually you used to go set up your distribution network, and now maybe the distributor is more of a KOL or something like that. Now, I'm probably overstating that. But uh, jump in, Gary, Kai. You know, what are you guys doing as far as, you know, we talked a little bit about marketing. It's really about KOL, social influencers, things like that. Uh, Gary, why don't you jump in? What have you guys been doing as far as looking at, you know, the, the best bang for the buck when it comes to you spending your marketing money? Is it the influencers? Is it the tier one, tier two? Yeah, it's, it's definitely, for us, we would love to work with the top level influencers in China, but it's not really an option. It's, it's, as, as everybody on, on the panel has said, it's really expensive to do business in China. And that's one of the things that we're learning. I mean, if you take, if you take the bottom, bottom fruit on the tree off the table because you've picked that up with your standard marketing message, well, you're essentially left with, with two options. And one of them is outrageously expensive and the other one takes years. So you're, you're a little bit stuck. Now, we think that, and, and, and I say think because I, I've been in this game for 18 months, right? Like I, I know maybe a little bit more than probably most of you and probably a lot less than most of you. So the, what we're attempting to do is work with mid, mid to lower t, tier influencers um, that we think will, uh, just like an athlete in the United States or a, a micro influencer in the United States, in exchange for product, in exchange for a little bit better exposure, we can get into a lot of lists worth 
um, hundreds or thousands of consumers versus one KOL in China that could be literally millions, if not tens of millions. Um, and the, the trade-off for that is, well, we're not having to put out literally $250,000, $500,000 in cash plus some kind of rev share offer. And it's literally what the KOLs are charging. Um, and instead, we're able to say, hey, for, for product or for some exchange of money, you know, let's try to do a lot of these really well at a lower level. Got it. So, Kai, you made the point that you went into China really on behalf of all your suppliers and things like that. So when you're thinking of social strategies as a brand, it's one thing. You've got lots of different uh, suppliers you know, that might have some different kind of influencers that they'd want to work with. How do you guys approach the whole kind of social advertising and social marketing and influencers in China? Yeah. So I think, you know, before I talk about uh, social media, you know, cha marketing channels in China overall uh, is, is in a way, everything we have here exists there, right? So there's paid search, there's affiliate, there's, you know, there, there's, uh, there's a social media and all that. But the, the way it works in China is slightly different and making certain channels more important than others. Uh, for a very simple example, uh, the Chinese search engine, they're not able to index products from Tmall or Taobao. So effectively, if you can index products, then making product discovery useless on a, on a search engine. So what you really have left is you know, uh, social media and uh, affiliate marketing. Um, those are actually goes hand in hand a lot of times. Um, so that's why you know, when you go to China, you, you, you spend a lot of your, your effort on social media. And when we look at social media, the, the market there is very fragmented compared to what we have here. You know, we have over here, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, they're pretty much one company. You're done, they, they dominate the whole, uh, the whole social media platforms here. But over, when you go to China, there's 12 of them, or there's probably a dozen of them, that you, and they, they all serve a different purpose, and they all have hundreds of millions of active uh, customers. So your customers are actually on all of them. So when we think about social media in China, we need to understand it's fragmented, that you need to be on all of them, you need to create content for each one. So you need to have video content, you need to have uh, you know, uh, a Weibo basically, you know, have byte con uh, byte biteable content. You take a, a large message into biteable sizes, and then you have WeChat, you can really only push once a week. So there's a different variety of it. So that making, so one thing that we should realize that social media in China is that your cost of operating social media uh, in China is higher because you've got, you've got to be young all of them, right? So, so, so you, need, you need to put manpower into it. You know, another thing is when we talk about social media here, we talk about Facebook, Instagram bidding. So you know, I look at my campaign this week. This week, you know, we have 300 of them. You know, they're they're, they're going to be running, and whichever one runs better, put more money into it. You're going to see immediate payback. We're seeing. We're talking about real, pure performance marketing. Over there, tracking is really difficult. It's app dominant in the world that you have cross app device tracking is almost impossible. So you really have to put in uh, dollars. You, you you have to less relying on performance marketing. So. Um, it's a, I would say China is a place, when you talk about social media in China, China is a place you invest in creativity, in invest in your campaign design, your message, in your copywriters, instead of running, uh, investing hard code cash into it. Uh, talking about <clears throat> um, influencer uh, is definitely important. That's a place that really uh, allows you to accumulate followers really quick. And those followers will become your organic traffic. So it's a, uh, so it's a, it's a process of accumulation. When we work with followers, uh, influencer, we, we, it's revolved that we definitely have certain advantage. We have, we pretty much work with all the top influencers around the world. So we, just like I mentioned, right, uh, when, when I think about Tmall, I think about all the advantage. We carry 800 brands. When I think about uh, influencer marketing, I think about how to leverage revolve uh, advantage. So we, would we'll leverage the, the top influencer we have. We will go directly into China. We want to start with the top influencer. That because we put them in, together with over Western influencer, they probably want to do it for free for me. Right. Because they got that advantage, ha able to stand on a global stage versus just a Chinese influencer. They want to get out there as well. By starting with them, when I go work on lower tiers, and they will, will again look up the top influencer, they will are willing to work with us at a much discounted rate or free most of the time. Uh, not purely free, I'm still gifting them uh, with, with products we have. 
But I think that what the really guts that uh, when we think about social marketing um, that really works is that you work with a massive number of influencers. Um, in China, that's, that's specifically really the case because uh, the product we have is relatively niche. You know, a, a, a influencer really work well in one industry may not work well for me, so it's a, it's a process of testing. So we end up to have a pool of influencers, let's say 300 of them on a monthly basis, and every month we add some new into it, and every month we pull some ones that doesn't quite work, and then the, the general evaluation period is about three months. Uh, we, we look at traffic, uh, we understand it's, you know, they're not going to generate pumping out of revenue the first months, but you've got to have traffic, right? If you have traffic, then they can look at your page view, your, your, your visit duration. And if you still don't have revenue for three months, that you're, you're done. Um, so, but we're trying to maintain uh, that, that pool of influencers, and that's normally most of them are, we're talking about mid to low influencers. Uh, from a payback perspective, really the, the bottom ones, that the smaller ones, they're probably the most it will give you the biggest band of buck. So I usually open these sessions by saying the conversation starts on the stage and then it extends into the audience. Uh, I do hope you guys will all stick around for the afternoon. We've got more sessions. We've got the awards uh, this evening and a reception. So, um, you know, we, we do have to kind of move on to the next session. So I don't, unless there's a quick question out there somewhere. Sorry, Bree, to make you uh, jump like that. But uh, I want to thank you guys. Uh, just remember that you've got, you know, kind of three different brands or leaders in three different stages and things like that. I thought that last, uh, you know, kind of discussion was, was spot on. That's somebody with lots of influencers, someone who's working with it, and someone who knows that that's basically their distribution strategy in China. So um, thank you guys so much and, and keep thank the you. conversation going. Thanks, guys. <laughs>